and gentlemen, to the very first episode of The Deep End, Sharkpool Gaming's only podcast. And if you're looking at my wonderful face, you must be on our YouTube channel. And if you are only hearing my voice, you're listening to our SoundCloud. And uh, I, I strongly suggest everybody goes to either one and uh, follow and subscribe and uh, support the show. And, you know, you'll get constant updates on whether or not we are putting a new episode up. But... For today's episode, we are going to talk about uh, 2014 in review and uh, where the direction that the gaming industry is going to be taking for 2015 coming up. Um, so I just wanted to start it off with, I wanted to list some of the notable AAA releases for 2014. Uh, so it would be Watch Dogs, Destiny, uh, you know, GTA V was released again for the, the new consoles, uh, Dragon Age, Smash Brothers, Titanfall. So on and so forth, correct? These are some notable AAA releases. Um, and it's... I see a common trend between these, all these titles that I just listed. Yes, they are all pretty good games, most for the most part, um, you know. But I look at the gaming industry and I see a very static industry. I see an industry that is not changing and not evolving very much. It's sticking to a very tired and true... Uh, formula and uh, lots of developers are sticking to the safer course of action they're 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 sticking to their sequels and they're making a lot of safe bet IPs safe bet IPs as a like for example destiny with Bungie Bungie created a sci-fi shooter as a new IP <sighs> what did they do before destiny they did halo which was a sci-fi shooter so we understand that they they know that genre extremely well. Makes sense, right? So I guess it makes sense that their brand new IP is a, is the exact same thing, is the exact almost the exact same game. It's not the exact same game, but the same premise. And we're seeing that a lot. Like uh, Watch Dogs from Ubisoft. Uh, you know that was another really big game last year um it was a third person open world action game very safe bet for ubisoft that there was no risks be, uh, being taken with that game they there was a brand new mechanic yes brand new mechanic but nothing about their open world formula changed the entire year they had four four major triple a title releases two assassin's creed games a Far Cry game, Watch Dogs, and I'm sure they had a, a lot of other games released throughout the year, but um, those were the four notable ones that uh, w was on everybody's radar for AAA releases. And uh, honestly, the only game last year that was a AAA title that was had the budget, had the development team, that took a risk was Shadow of Mordor. Shadow of Mordor was the only one, and I know that a lot of people say that it, it was Assassin's Creed, um, I understand, I understand. I played through that game and uh, I can give a better analysis of it than I would be able to maybe uh, Watch Dogs because I didn't play Watch Dogs as much as I played uh, Shadow of Mordor. I actually beat Shadow of Mordor. But uh, Shadow of Mordor, it was extremely similar to WB's safe, uh, free-flowing combat that was made popular by the Arkham games, correct? So... But the, the Nemesis system was something brand new. The, the gaming industry has never really seen something like that. That it, it generates on its own and it's constantly updating. It's giving people like names and personalities. And it was almost like a procedurally generated uh, like game within a game. You know, like it was almost its own. Like it was great. Like I caught myself not doing the main story multiple times because I was off murdering, you know, Barfa, the, the fucking steel jaw, but he has a steel jaw because I killed him last time, but he's still alive somehow, so Shadow of Mordor was, I think, the only AAA game that took a risk, because that could have ended up being just the stupidest, like, dumbest mechanic, but it actually ended up being its strongest, which everybody was expecting it to be, but we understand where expectations led us last year. <laughs> We understand where uh, expecting things and actually getting them were two separate things. Um, 
but but I understand. Okay, let, let's talk about the let's talk about something real quick. All these games that I've listed, the consoles are still a very young. We're still a very young generation right now. The PS4, Xbox One are still very young in their life cycle. We and look at previous generations' early life cycles. We had some really good games come out, but like for the PlayStation 2, we had Final Fantasy X. X came out really early. GameCube Smash Brothers came out really early. But, but, look at all the other games that came out. We understand that there was a gym, but where, what, what other games came out that left a lasting impression on the industry? Not very much. You can take a look back. There's not very much. Uh, PlayStation 3, Xbox 360. I mean, we had Layer for the PlayStation 3. I mean, you could, I guess, whatever, motion control. But we're still very early in the life cycle. So developers are still trying to understand how the hardware works. And I think as we get older, as the this consoles get older, we're going to see developers starting to understand their hardware much, much more because they're still learning the ins and outs. But I, I think that that's something that um, publishers are taking these safe bets with these established IPs and established genres because they don't understand the console hardware. They, they don't understand how to utilize it to its fullest potential and deliver a true next-gen title that may change with 2015. So, I just wanted to talk about some of the highest rated games for 2014. And, uh, you're, you're gonna be, I'm getting this information from Metacritic, so I understand Metacritic is not a super reliable source, but I want to say that it is a, a culmination of information. So, I, I want to, Metacritic for 2014 we had Grand Theft Auto for the Xbox One and PS4 in number one and two. Then we had The Last of Us in number three. They had respectively 97 and 95 for both games. Uh, rounding out the top 14 was Diablo 3, Rayman Legends, Fez, Guacamelee. So look at that. We had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven games. Half of the top 14 games for last year were re-releases. Re uh, re so, what does that say about our industry right now? We are in a state of, we're trying to get some new stuff out to you, so here's some old stuff that you hopefully still like. So, I mean, I understand. I'm okay with that too, to, a, to an, an extent. We are getting a little HD remastered, you know, hungover right now because everybody's getting one, but, I mean, I understand what's happening within the industry right now. People are like, man, we need money for our new games. Let's put out an old game, sell people their childhood back in pretty pictures. I'm okay with that. I liked my childhood. I like that Final Fantasy X came out for the PS3 and it's probably coming out for the PS4 because I like that game. It was my childhood, so I'll buy it again as an adult. I'm okay with that. A lot of people aren't, but I understand that we... You know, we're getting further away from these consoles, so we're getting further away from means of playing these games, and they want to keep them relevant with um, the current generation, which is totally okay. But I wanted to look at Fez, Guacamelee, and, uh, and Transistor. Those were games that came out last year, and they were all indie games. And uh, indie games seem to be the only games nowadays that are pushing the envelope for the frontier of gaming. Nowadays, we, we, we see AAA staying very safe, but we see indie games branching out and trying new things out. And I mean, that's why I support indie games so much because these developers can do what they want. And when they get to do what they want, we get these amazing, like, short packages. People complain indie games aren't long enough, but like, I. I really do think indie games are the perfect length because you're not paying $60, you're paying, you know, 20, 15, sometimes 25, but I mean you're getting a condensed crafted experience. Like uh I bought Journey, I've bought Hotline Miami, um I bought Transistor and Bastion. I love super giant games. <laughs> You'll come to learn that. Um but 
indie games seem to be the only ones that are really pushing the envelope for what is normal in a video game and I appreciate them so much for that and uh, I think AAA can learn something from indie indie developers and these publishers these big publishers need to learn that taking a risk is not a bad deal you know it's it's not bad at all like who would have thought a game about you in a robe in a desert just walking and flying sometimes with random people no chat was gonna be a mega hit that was journey journey one of the best games probably of all time probably one of the most well-crafted um, experiences in gaming was just that you're just a guy walking like Square Enix Ubisoft would have looked at that and be like come on where are you can't put guns in it you know so I think Indie developers are extremely important, and I will continue to support them the whole way. So, but 2014 is behind us now, correct? 2014 is behind us. We can we can get past all the disappointments and all the missteps, you could say, missteps from some of our favorite developers, and look forward to what looks to be an extremely promising 2015. 2015 notable releases. I'm going to go down a list right now for you guys. Uh, notable releases for 2015. We've got Batman, the third game in the Batman series. We've got Zelda Wii U, which looks amazing. We've got Rhyme. I'm personally, that's going to be, like, I am so jacked up for Rhyme, but we'll get into that later. The Witcher 3, uh, Metal Gear Solid, The Phantom Pain, the Division, and No Man's Sky. And those are some of the bigger releases that are going to be coming out in 2015. And uh, I think that these games that I just named off, I really hope that these games kick the trend of 2014 for mediocrity and uh, not, really, not really delivering on any front of innovation that we've been expecting. Um, and I really hope that, uh, you know, it looked like Zelda Wii U is going to be just a powerhouse of a game. Like, I, I'm i going to have to buy a Wii U for that game. It looks just incredible. Uh, Rhyme looks really good. And The Witcher 3, that is, that is the key one right there. Because uh, CD Projekt Red, I think, is uh, probably the best, best uh, developer, if, if not in the whole industry because of their stance and their their basically their PR is so good like I understand their business they understand that but they understand what we want to hear and it looks like they're gonna they they're gonna back up everything that they've told us and it's just refreshing to see a developer kick the common trend of you know here's a CG trailer that looks amazing, and then here's an actual game, and it looks like shit, you know? I just, they look like they're going to kick that, and I really hope they shake the industry up and uh, really show what, it's, what it means to be a real player's coach. You know, I, I see them as a player's coach. They're rooting for us as much as we are rooting for them. So, uh, But 2015 seems to be the year that we need to prove that we are tired of being jerked around. Um, I say that word as in we're being told one thing and we get delivered another. Um, the only way that we can show that we don't want a repeat of 2014 is by proving it by not buying these games, by not pre-ordering. Because pre-ordering is an awful, awful consumer uh, practice. We we talk about we want to see change. We want to see uh, you know full games to be bought for a full price instead of being patched to death in the first two weeks. Because we it, it's just we buy these games at sixty dollars, and if half a million games were pre-ordered and paid off, like the developer, if they've already made their money back, like I know it, it's a little bit of a stretch and a little bit like you know, speculation, no, like, thinking that developers are, you know, counting their money before they're done with the game, but it's just bad consumer practice, and it undermines, like, ownership. We, we have to prove 
that the current trend of the AAA game is not what we want. And the only way we can prove that is with our wallets. And I, I just think publishers are trying to nickel and dime and uh, they're undermining ownership with our pre-order bonuses that are exclusive. Let me just talk about Evolve for a second. I was extremely excited for this game. This game looks really good. It comes from a good pedigree, the people who made Left 4 Dead. Um, but they're, they have lost me completely with their pre-order bullshit. Um, I think, I'm, I'm just thinking from memory here, I, I think that one of the four monsters that you get to play as in the game is locked behind pre-order. And I also heard recently that uh, if you pre-order the game on a certain platform, I think it was Xbox One, you get to skip a quarter of the progression. So a quarter of the game, you don't even have to play. And then 25% of the monsters that you can play as in the game won't be available. From my understanding, that's their wording, and if I've taken it the wrong way, that's their fault for wording it that way. Because I'm, under, I'm in the impression that one-fourth of the monsters in that game are locked behind a pre-order bonus, which infuriates me. I undermining ownership is one of the th main reasons Xbox One had such a hard time getting off the ground because they undermined everyone's ownership of their games of their consoles they wanted to do the whole um, you can't borrow games and can't play used games undermining ownership when you buy something you expect to be able to do whatever you want with it that's why they had such a hard time getting off the ground and I uh, and I fully expect this to be to happen across the industry across the industry for developers undermining our ownership and we're going to respond in a a way that they don't want us to respond they, they they're going to keep restricting content and locking it behind you know downloading their app or going on their website or you know making these third party uh decisions and they're going to they're going to push us away. They're going to isolate their core market. That's what's going to happen. So so hopefully we as consumers can help dictate where the industry goes in the coming years. We can uh show them that this is not okay and that we don't want this. So but with that, that concludes the very first episode of the Deep End podcast. I want to thank you guys for stopping by and listening to me. And uh, if you enjoyed the show, definitely head over to our YouTube and SoundCloud. Follow us, subscribe to us on both of those, and uh, head over to Twitter and Facebook where we also have accounts there. And you can get our snarky updates and uh, everything Shark Pool. So we can, we can get you guys that. And with that, my name is Shane Walters, and I will see you guys next time.